On behalf of Oslo Jewish Museum, I would like to welcome you all to this uh, seminar and to the launch of the special issue of Scandinavian Journal of History. For those of you who don't know me, my name is uh, Mats Tangestun. I'm the academic director of this museum, which sounds much better in English than in Norwegian. <laughs> uh, and this week actually marks my 20 years anniversary at this little museum. Yeah. <laughs> We are very pleased to be able to uh, put together this seminar. Uh, and uh, we have uh, good colleagues on, in this museum, both Sjeti Brad Simonsen, which has been one of the, one of the um, uh, oh, editors, sorry, editors, uh, uh, a very talented and also very productive in that order, uh, historian and researcher here at the museum. And we also have Nicola Kasher, who also is one of the editor. Uh, she's not technically working with us, but she spent so much time in this museum that we feel that we sort of have adopted her. And it's also very nice to have a person with her, uh, uh, with her uh, as skills. <laughs> with, with just paying a couple of coffees each week. Uh, I would just like to conclude by saying a big thank you to both Kjetil and to Nicola and to all the other authors that you will hear throughout these two days. Uh, I would also like to thank our staff, Ingrid and, and Ingelise, who has helped us put together this. And all of you who decided to take two days at least, one at least, two days maybe, hopefully, to be here. Now I would like to give this... Uh, Microphone to Nicola Kasher. Uh, Nicola, she is an associate professor at the University of Östfold. Um, she's also an affiliated researcher at Uppsala University, where she's part of a large research project on fascism, together with several of the co authors of this special issue that we are here today. Nicola is a specialist in Norwegian, German, and Nordic fascism cooperation. And together with Ola Sivonen, who's here, there, uh, she heads the NURFAS, which is the Network for Nordic Fascism Studies. And since you're also all here, and since 1st of September we start uh, the Jewish Cultural Base, I would also like you all to grab one of these before you leave today and to check out all the events that we have from the 1st of September all the way to the 14th of September, which is the Klesmer Night and which all of you have to be here, and you have to come back again, of course. Okay, Nicola, here we go. Thank you, Max, for your very kind introduction. I'm very happy to hear that I'm finally adopted. I worked so hard with it. Um, Kit and I are the editors of this special issue, which we are very glad to be able to present today. Oh, Pahaka. Yeah. Okay. Opa Do I need to repeat everything I just said? Yes. Oh, um, I think I won't. Uh, anyway, we are very happy to present this special issue, yeah, and we, which title is "The Print Culture of Conspiracist Antisemitism." Um, and we're also very glad to uh, have some of the finest researchers of antisemitism from the Nordic countries um, being part of this special issue, who all with present their papers in the next couple of days. Some people still look as if they wouldn't understand me. Okay. Um, you have this one, why do I have this one? Okay, anyway. Um, I don't know if it works. Uh, is it? <laughs> we are academians. No. Right. Thank you. So now you're. No, I have some sound. I think. Switched on too. Um, just to give you a bit background information, how this came about, because Hit and I we just had started working on a journal called Weltdienst a couple yeah. of years ago, which we actually wanted to focus on, but then we decided not to. And then Graham uh, Macklin from sitting over there from CREX, from the Center for Research on Anti-Semitism um, Extremism, asked us, 
whether we would like to do a special issue on Welt Deans. And first we said, well, maybe not. And then we said, okay, maybe yes. But then we ended up uh, rather focusing on several Nordic countries and several journals. So the idea was from, from just having one journal on the focus to, to uh, have a comparison between the Nordic countries and anti-Semitic conspiracies journals in the Nordic countries. And then we also got Graham to join us and Tony Morant, who's not here today, unfortunately. He's in Brazil, so he's excused. We wrote an article on anti-Semitism in the Spanish Falange, so that we not even were looking at the Nordic countries, but we were able to compare them to, 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 to other cases in Europe, which um, had quite a different situation regarding... Uh, and a different Jewish historical context. Exactly. Yeah, and religious context in the Spanish case also. Um, I mean, you have the program on your laps or on your chairs, but this is what we've been doing to uh, present the next couple of days. Um, Shiti will, in just a couple of minutes, talk about the theoretical frame of, um, of the special issue and our ideas behind it. Then we will present um, the papers and um, tomorrow afternoon, so we mustn't leave before that, Mats will also have a guided tour through the Jewish Museum and the surroundings. So we hope that as many as possible will join us on that too. Um, this is, um, I don't know if I said that already, it was um, something we started out having with Graham, so this is also a cooperation with the Center for Research on Extremism, and it's also a product of, of NORFAS, the Network for Nordic Fascism Studies, which, um, which uh, Mats just mentioned. Um, I think I just leave it to you. Uh, Mats has already introduced it, so he's a researcher at the Jewish Museum, he, before that, worked as a PhD candidate at the Holocaust Center, where we actually ran the same project on occupation history. And you have published a lot about anti-Semitism in recent years. Just last year, you published the book, and the English title is In the Shadows of the Holocaust, and the Norwegian title is Issue of Holocaust. Also, the and now you say it in English. <laughs> Yeah, correct. It was actually published three weeks before the center. Okay, so the floor is yours, and I guess I'll switch the. Yeah, there go, bro. Okay, thank you for your nice words, Nicola. This uh, presentation is actually based on an article that I am. Nicola have written together, uh, my partner in crime. So in this presentation, I have to try to, uh, to combine two souls in one single voice in a sort of Norwegianized English or something like that. Okay. In the shadow of the First World War and the Bolshevik Revolution of 1917, anti-Jewish conspiracy beliefs gained momentum in Europe. Yeah. The masters of the battlefield and the political revolutions and upheavals that followed gave fuel to an apocalyptic climate of fear, desperation, polarization and insecurity. This mood also became a fertile soil for conspiracy beliefs in general and anti-Semitism in particular. Conspiracist anti-Semitism served as a comprehensive framework to our interpretation to make sense of broad social, political, economic and cultural changes that were considered as harmful and threatening by the believers. The most well-known and widely disseminated publication in this context was obviously the uh, pamphlet that has been called The Protocols of the Elders of Zion. The Protocols was and is a falsification first published in Imperial Russia in 1903. It was written by the anti-Semites themselves 
with the aim of spreading the idea that a worldwide Jewish conspiracy actually existed, that the Jews worked systematically and in secret to conquer world power. According to the protocols, economic crisis, revolutions, wars, capitalism, socialism, liberalism, Freemasonry, atheism, and democratic ideas in general were all seen as, were all invented by the Jews as a part of a global plot. After the Bolshevik Revolution, the protocols were translated into multiple languages and circulated in large numbers. A Swedish version came out in 1919, and in 1920, the document reached the public sphere in countries such as Germany, Great Britain, France, Norway, Finland, United States, and Poland. Other publications inspired by the protocols were also, also came out. In the United States, for example, Henry Ford's book, a newspaper, Dearborn Independent, published a serial of articles exposing the so-called Jewish world conspiracy between 1920 and 1922. These were later to be republished and spread on a massive scale, even in Europe, as a book titled The International Jew. With Nazi Germany's invasion of the democratic countries of Western Europe, former underground proponents of conspiracist anti-Semitism became, at least partly, political collaborators. Several of the publications that had belonged to the political margins during the interwar period were now integrated into the political mainstream and even supported by a fascist state apparatus. The myth of a Jewish world conspiracy served as a cornerstone of national socialist ideology and propaganda. During the Second World War, all the enemies of Nazi Germany, Great Britain, the Soviet Union, the United States, the exiled governments, and the underground resistance movements were all represented as puppets of a global Jewish plot. From the viewpoint of the Nazi perpetrators, the politics of persecution and ultimately genocide was seen as a form of racial and national self-defense against an imaginary entity called international Jewry. Our special issue of Scandinavian Jewish studies, or Nordisk Judaistik, examines conspiracist anti-Semitism in the Nordic countries from the Bolshevik Revolution of 1917 to the defeat of Nazi Germany in 1945. Our attention is directed at anti-Semitism at the European periphery rather than the classical case of German National Socialism. Our main focus is the Nordic countries. Still, by contrasting the Nordic cases with Spain and Britain, this special issue also provides a comparative approach. All these different uh, individuals' contributions will be discussed and presented more carefully later in this conference. For the moment, therefore, I will primarily focus on some of the general theoretical premises of the special issue in, as a whole, particularly by defining terms such as anti-Semitism, conspiracism, and conspiracist anti-Semitism. Anti-Semitism is a high, complex and highly dynamic historical phenomenon. As a term, it was actually coined by German anti-Semites themselves during the 1870s. 
In this particular context, uh, the word served as a kind of brand name of a social and political movement that claimed all negative traits of modernity to be caused by Jewish influence. During the last decades of the 19th century, the very word Semitism was commonly associated with new patterns of development considered to be disrupting and destructive. The anti-Semitic movements that evolved in countries such as Germany, France and Austria not only opposed the prevailing social and cultural and political developments associated with modernity, they also explained them through the prism of anti-Jewish stereotypes. In short, political anti-Semitism was often part and parcel of a broader ideological worldview that were highly critical of liberalism, socialism, materialism, and the very spirit of the great French Revolution of 1789. After the Second World War and the Holocaust, this usage of anti-Semitism as a kind of positive self-reference of a movement was completely discredited and came to a halt. From then on, the word anti-Semitism has been applied as a term referring to hostile attitudes and actions against the Jews as Jews. This is also the common usage of the word today. Still, the relationship between continuity and changes in this the long degree of anti-Semitism has been debated among scholars. Some scholars apply the word anti-Semitism more or less exclusively to the modern racist, nationalist, and political form of anti-Semitism that evolved, especially in the late 19th century. Others emphasize the gradual evolution from traditional Christian anti-Judaism to new forms of hostility, typically then using anti-Semitism as a kind of umbrella term for various forms of anti-Jewish thoughts and actions through the ages. Since this special issue focuses on the era between 1917 and 1945, it is not our ambition to solve this ongoing dispute. In general, however, we agree with historian Robert Chazan, that, who has stressed that every new stage in the evolution of anti-Jewish thinking is marked by a dialectical interplay between old and new anti-Jewish stereotypes. In other words, anti-Semitism is neither static nor eternal. It is permanently in motion due to changing historical circumstances. Still, anti-Semitism also consists of some stable core elements, particularly the construction of the Jew as an evil, powerful, and disrupting force of the world. Our understanding of anti-Semitism is also based on the definition uh, de developed by sociologist Helen Fine. Fine understands, as you can see here in the quote, anti-Semitism as a structure of hostile beliefs towards truth, manifested, for instance, in myth, ideology, folklore, and imagery. In addition, she also describes anti-Semitism as a form of practice from social or legal discrimination in one end of the scale to collective state violence, which results in and or is designed to distance, displace, or destroy Jews as Jews. This approach provides us with the opportunity to treat anti-Semitism as a multifaceted phenomenon that comes in different ideological shapes and with various levels of intensity. Anti-Semitism can manifest itself both as a diffuse cultural infrastructure of stereotypes, 
not necessarily conspicuous, and on the other end of the scale, as a total anti-Jewish worldview. This special issue focuses mainly on anti-Semitism as a more or less full-blown worldview, a broad perception of reality where all negative developments and social problems are claimed to be orchestrated by a Jewish plot. In the era between 1917 and 1945, such a totalist anti-Jewish worldview was particularly the trademark of the political right. Still, there was also a dynamic relationship between ideological propagandistic anti-Semitism on the one hand and the much more widespread everyday anti-Semitism on the other. The stereotype of Jewish Bolshevism, for example, was adopted by large sector sectors of the political mainstream during the 1920s. Also, the terms conspiracism and uh, conspiracy and conspiracy theory needs to be clarified. In the most minimalistic sense, a conspiracy can be defined as an action or series of actions that affects others and that are conducted in secret by two or more individuals. Real conspiracies exist. A bank robbery planned or by two or more persons is, for example, obviously a conspiracy if they not write about it uh, in the newspaper before they commit their actions, which is rather stupid. In this perspective, the term conspiracy theory can, in the broadest possible sense, simply be defined as a theory about a conspiracy. Some scholars reserve the term for theories that are false or at least suspicious, while others apply it, it more broadly to claims that might be true or untrue. In the larger public debate, conspiracy is closely associated with the first meaning uh, with speculative and false claims, which, it should be added, was obviously the case with the ideas we discuss in our context. Conspiracy theories or conspiracy beliefs can be both limited and large in its scope. Sociologist Michael Barkun differs between three forms of theories, even conspiracies, systemic conspiracies and super conspiracies. Event conspiracies are typically theories where an alleged conspiracy is held responsible for one limited, distinct event, such as, for example, the murder of John F. Kennedy or the death of Princess Diana, which, among several conspiracy theories, are claimed to be a result of a secret plot. Systemic and super conspiracies, on the other hand, are based on the belief that the conspiracy has broad goals, that they strive to control a country, a region, the global economy, the world press, the United Nations, or even the entire world. A third term, conspiracism or conspiracist worldview, refers to a perception of reality itself uh, a perception of reality where a secret plot is described as the very driving force or motor of history and politics as such. These kind of worldviews are highly dualistic. Sorry, I'm trying to go back again. There. They divide the world strictly into two opposing categories. On the one hand, the evil, powerful conspirators, and on the other, the enlightened elite that have covered the alleged plot, the latter referring to the conspiracy believers themselves. Conspiracism is also intentionalist. 
It claims that more or less everything that happens in this world has been secretly staged or planned. In other words, that nothing occurs by coincidence. Finally, conspiracism is also a closed off or monological worldview or belief system. Counter-argumentation and counter-evidence are claimed to be staged by the conspiracy and therefore categorically denied. Conspiracy beliefs and conspiracism has been a core element of anti-Semitism for centuries. The image of the Jew as evil and subversive was an integral part of the Christian anti-Judaism already of pre-modern times. In the med medieval and early modern era, the Jews were linked with the forces of the devil and anti-Christ, and they were also accused of plotting against Christian civilizations through the acts of such as ritual murder, host desecration, and well poisoning. During the process of secularization and modernization in the 18th and 19th century, traditional Christian perceptions of the Jews were supplanted with and partly replaced by arguments based on nation and race. The roots of the modern theory of a Jewish conspiracy can be traced back to the reactions against the French Revolution of 1789. Still, it was first and foremost during the second half of the 19th century that such ideas became a hallmark of the ultra-conservative and extreme right. Within these circles, socialism, liberalism, fin finance, capitalism, atheism, the modern press, and the movements for women's emancipation were all claimed to be staged by the powerful and omnipotent Jew. In short, conspiracist anti-Semitism served as a tool for orientation and explanation, infusing a kind of coherence and meaning into a complex and often confusing modern world. A particular extreme variation of conspiracist anti-Semitism, which became uh, the ideological pillar of national social socialism in Germany, as well as in, for example, Norway, has been co conceptualized as redemptive anti-Semitism by historian Sol Friedländer. Redemptive anti-Semitism perceives the past and the present as a life and death struggle between the forces of good and the forces of evil. In addition, it also claims that all important negative traits or uh, negative historical developments has been staged by a secret omnipotent Jewish conspiracy. Redemptive anti-Semitism is also based on a vision of national and racial rebirth through the struggle against the so-called Jew. In other words, Redemptive anti-Semitism offer a message of salvation through exclusionary acts and ultimately through anti-Jewish actions. In this perspective, the anti-Semites has also tended to consider themselves as members of an enlightened and chosen elite who have revealed the hidden hand behind the world. In short, our ambition with this special issue is to expand the knowledge of a particular stage in the long but still dynamic and ever-changing trajectory of European and particularly Nordic anti-Semitism. In addition, it's also our aim to widen the general knowledge of conspiracism as a uh, as a historical force, particularly by exposing its potential for discrimination, persecution, and violence. To be sure, ideology alone is not a sufficient explanation either for the Holocaust or for genocidal violence in a more general sense. 
Anti-Jewish ideas were widespread even in countries where mass violence against the Jewish minorities did not occur, such as, for example, the United States during the 1920s. Still, conspiracist anti-Semitism was obviously a necessary precondition for the Holocaust. Between 1939 and 1945, the Nazi interpretation of the ongoing war as a life and death struggle against a fictive entity called the International, International Jury became instrumental in the escalation of the anti-Jewish policy. Although the focus of our issue and this conference is historical, the topic also remains highly relevant. Knowledge of the anti-Jewish conspiracy tradition of the past is essential to avoid new expressions of anti-Semitism in the present, as well as other forms of dehumanization and demonization of the other. Thank you very much. Where is the microphone? It's there. Hi, bye. Beklager. Um, Christians here at um, Jodene Hardrept Jesus, or therefore Dimo Drepe Jodene. Um, Jesus, first of all, was sel Jode. Fiskan had a boot no. Hamas will have had him till fange also. For the other, the other who had not had the rest of Jesus, the Romerne, for the Kosh Festels, were the Romish Kmote and the rest of the people. So the other who had not had the rest of the Romerne. No, personally, I have been a member of the Italian Italian Culture Institute in Oslo, Unor i-ai fost alte adevarice iodene men romerne som ha drept Iesus, dar for i-ai ike meri invitașon til de rescultur manifestașoner som i-ai licte ganske god. De harf, fiind muzic, de men i-ai din viterer mea ike fă de i-ai sat romerne ha drept Iesus o ike iodene. Vă atete me de întulătări sat iodene ha drept Iesus? Oh yeah, <laughs> I, I agree with you. Uh, it's ob obviously uh, uh, a false accusation in any, any sense. So uh, I think um, the, the the stereotype of the the Jew, uh, the Jew in uh, apostrophes, obviously it's a construction. Uh, uh, as Christ killers was uh, became a part of the early Christian demonization of the Jew which uh, uh, woke up in a sense or, or were, were part of parcel, became part of parcel of the Christian identity formation, where it was important to make a distance for, between the old pact and the new pact. And uh, as a result of that, a whole um, specter of anti-Jewish uh, theological tropes evolved, including uh, the, the, the representation of the Jew as a Christ killer. And the representation of the Jew as the killer of Christ also survived in modern anti-Semitic agitation. I found examples of it in the, in the Norwegian press during the 1920s when uh, the discussion was actually Bolshevism. They said like uh, the, the Bo Jewish Bols Bolsheviks are, uh, are um, suppressing re religious people in Russia as they killed Christ, Christ uh, 2,000 years ago, for example. So these are, uh, in a sense, uh, long-time stereotypes in European culture. 
Uh, thank you so much, Chetan, for, for this talk and for, to both of you for a very, two very interesting articles uh, in your journal. Um, I may be asking this question too early, maybe it fits better in, in a later, uh, later talk, but I was wondering if you could say something about how widespread these ideas were uh, in Norway at different points in, in time among the Norwegian population. Yeah, yeah. Nicola so is going to talk a bit about it okay. later, but, but I think I can s answer very general. Uh, propagandistic anti-Semitism. Ideological propagandistic anti-Semitism. Anti-Semitism as a sort of uh, complete ideological worldview uh, and a, a complete uh, total explanation for modernity was not that widespread in Norway. Most of these milieus before the German occupation was rather ma marginal. At the same time, a broader but vaguer cultural anti-Semitism in the form of different stereotypes, even conspiracy stere stereotypes, were widespread. If you read the uh, Norwegian satirical press, for example, there are the Jew are uh, visualized as capitalists, as the incarnation of a moral un Norwegian uh, um, norms, etc., etc. So, so while the most extreme, uh, total ideological anti-Semitism was rather marginal, everyday anti-Semitism was widespread. That's an, uh, an important distinction, and it, it was much more accepted, obviously, in the broad uh, the public sphere before 1940 than, after, than from 1945, for example, where it was scandalized. Hmm. <clears throat> um, first, I would like to thank you for uh, providing us this framework, because it makes it um, perhaps easier to understand the history and also the present. Yeah. And also, I would like to ask uh, if we know why the Jew was singled out for such a long time, why the Jew? Do we know what they were trying to achieve? Yeah. In all these different uh, versions of anti-Semitism. I think it's important to recognize that it wasn't always the Jew. You have also have other groups that have been singled out. And wh when we speak about, for example, Christian anti-Semitism, Christian anti-Semitism, uh, uh, Christian anti-Judaism in the, in the, for example, to take one example, the high medieval era, was intensified in a period of time where uh, the persecution of all alt groups were intensified. Heretics, uh, lepers, for example. So it was part of a broader, uh, a broader, in that context, for example, it was part of a broader uh, intensification and narrowization in the sense of the Christian, uh, Christian worldview and practice. Uh, and that was often also the case in other... Uh, so it's, it's important to... Why the Jews... Why and, uh, uh, But if we, we reformulate the question a bit and ask more about what, what, what is the reason for the continuity of anti-Semitism, I think one major structural feature here is that uh, Christianity, uh, f European Christianity from early on, uh, in the early... Uh, defined to a high degree uh, itself against the Jew. While the Chris, Chris, Christian values were defined by saying what it was not, it was not Jewish in a sense. Moral and moral. Uh, and these structures have been uh, consistent in a sense, in, even within the framework of secularization and modernization. Uh, and I think that that's one question, but at the same time, we have to, to we should not uh, uh, um, analyze anti-Semitism as a kind of eternal and straightforward theological, theological phenomenon. It hasn't evolved in this direction, but like this. At some part, times in history, anti-Semitism has been strong. At other contexts, this has been rather unimportant in the broader picture. So that's important to historize it and to, to look when you analyze anti-Semitism also as a historical phenomenon, to look at the concrete situation and context that uh, uh, anti-Semitism uh, escalates within. Uh, yes, 
Uh, I was wondering if uh, it's possible to identify any point in time uh, where the idea of uh, the Jew as one entity in, in contrast to the Jewish people or the Jews uh, uh, manifests uh, itself. It is, of course, uh, obviously there when the Nazis came to power and, uh, and, and used it in the Sturmites there in the 20s with uh, Henry Ford. Uh, but you can see it in publications from the 18th century and from the 17th century. When does the uh, idea of uh, the Jew as one entity uh, come along? As a along? type? Yes, yes as, a, as, one, as, as opposed to uh, the Jewish people, Jews, where does the Jew, um, what the one entity perception yeah. of Jews, uh, is, is it possible to time that to, to, to a certain area? Yeah. Uh, it was uh, highly present already in uh, pre-modern uh, Christian anti-Judaism. Uh, I, mean, I mean, the construction of the Jew as a type, in a sense, as a character, yeah, yeah. more, yeah, yeah, yeah. As a, as, or as a, a figure, symbolic figure. That was a very important uh, part already of, of the demonization of the Jew in the, in the pre-modern medieval times, I think. Thank you. Uh, Thank you very much. Um, it was this question about the responsibility of killing Jesus. And it seems to me by reading the Bible that uh, the Gospels, as they are uh, later and later, as Johannes' uh, yeah. Gospels the latest, is more anti-Jewish than the first Gospels. And you can see it where, for instance, that uh, picture of uh, Pilate, uh, Pilate uh, Pontius the Pilate, and uh, he is washing his hands and he's a white robe and all these kind of things. And I think it is because they want to take away the responsibility from the Romans. Mm. Everyone knows that uh, Pontius, the, uh, uh, what do you call him, Pontius the pilot, he was so cruel that the Romans actually uh, took away his uh, position. They couldn't even accept his cruelty. So it's not very likely that he would wash his hands and all these kind of things. But it seems like uh, that, uh, especially with the Johannes' uh, the gospel, uh, they say things that they were afraid of the Jews. And it's a little strange thing to say, as they were Jews themselves. But of course, they had dispersed into the Roman Empire at that time. And it was very important for them not to, uh, to be friends with the Romans. That's probably some of the reasons. Mm. It's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a rather interesting parallel here with, uh, with the Judas figure, who is uh, in the later, um, as later the texts are, uh, the more... Uh, the Judas figure are transformed to a Jew. <laughs> in uh, uh, Maccabi, I think, has uh, written very interesting about that transformation of, of the Judas figure from the early Gospels to the later Gospels, and, and obviously the later uh, post-Gospel Christian uh, identity formation. I think it's a, it's a, it's a very interesting book. <laughs> Judas Iscariot and the Myth of Jewish Evil is the title of that book. So. Yeah, two things. First, I would like to know which organization didn't invite you again. I didn't catch that. The Italian? Okay, okay. Yeah, okay. Um, we, we are deep into religion now. Um, in the New Testament, mm. there is an this discussion between Jewish people. Somebody who support and follow Jesus, somebody who don't. And there is a discussion between them. Hmm. That's it. So. And then we have this uh, question. Why is the church, has the church such a bad history? I think, first of all, they have managed to, to fluid it themselves to make themselves bigger and the Jewish people don't. And then I think the people of the church listening to them and living in a society that was also anti-Jews, that has, to, has had to influence them. That, that also influenced the political left. If you go to them, to them, um, a big important house in Oslo, Hontverkern, um, you see anti-Semitic vague paintings from the 30s. 
So that, that they also, it, it influenced the whole society, and nobody can say they are free of it. But if these Christians, if we go back to what Jesus himself said, he said, nobody take my life. I give it freely. Yeah, yeah. So this most stupid thing for Christians to uh, um, accuse anybody else for killing Jesus is to me a sign that they haven't really got that. Ska vi gå vidare? Yes. Continue with the program. I wonder, Master, if you rather keep this. Okay, then I have to take off my um, hat as a lecturer and uh, put on a fictive hat as an organizer. Next speaker out uh, is Pavel Aun. Pavel is a Finnish church historian and scholar of anti-Semitism affiliated with the university in Helsinki. His PhD thesis from 2017 dealt with anti-Semitism in the Evangelic Lutheran Church of Finland between 1917 and 1933. He has also worked as a guest researcher at Uppsala University, and his articles on contemporary and historical anti-Semitism have been published both in Finland and abroad. Pavel is going to talk about the introduction of the myth of Jewish Bolshevism in the Finnish public between the first years after 1917. Pavel, the floor is yours. So everybody can hear me, probably, yes, good. <clears throat> okay. So I said my name is Paavo Ahonen, I come from University of Helsinki. Uh, thank you for inviting me here and uh, having this lovely, lovely seminar. Uh, my subject here is uh, new anti-Semitic stereotype in the Finnish press after the October Revolution, meaning the Judeo-Bolshevist conspiracy. Uh, and the time frame of my presentation is uh, from November 1917 to September of 1920. So I will mainly talk about events after October Revolution, and as uh, most of you probably know, uh, October Revolution was a big thing a uh, big turning point also to Finland as a country. Uh, Finland was uh, seized the opportunity and declared independence only a couple of weeks after the October Revolution in the uh, 6th of December 1917. And uh, before that, Finland was an autonomic part of Russia uh, for a bit over 100 years. And, uh, and before that, Finland was part of Sweden. And uh, at the time when Finland got independent in 1917, uh, uh, there were less than 2,000 Jews living in Finland, so it was a really small minority. They were living in practically uh, three biggest cities, Helsinki, Turku, uh, and, and Vipuri, uh, or Buen Vipark, uh, in other languages. <laughs> and uh, and uh, therefore, most of Finns probably had never met a Jew in their life. So for, so for um, most people who read the newspapers and read these news about this new stereotype, uh, that uh, these news that included this new stereotype, for them this whole question was theoretical mainly. Uh, it, it did not personify to their neighbors or, or people they knew. Um, uh, Jews in Finland did not have, have civil rights when Finland got independent. Uh, as 
did uh, the Jews in Russia. They, they also didn't have civil rights uh, or equal rights in any, any manner. Uh, in the 1870s, uh, they started a long-lasting 50-year 50 50 year struggle uh, for civil rights of Jews to get emancipation. Uh, and uh, during that process, there was strong anti-Semitism present in the parliamentary debate. Also, in the beginning in the 1870s and until the last one in the, uh, 1917. So, yeah, so uh, just to outline what I'm talking about here, a couple of words on, ant on anti-Semitic myths or anti-Semitic conspiracies, as one might put it. Uh, Chetil already uh, talked a lot about them. But uh, as you mentioned, anyone who has studied any history of anti-Semitism, uh, you might have been familiar with the con conspiracies such as uh, blood libel, like ritual murders, well poisoning, or host desecration. And these anti-Jewish blames, they were most common in the high Middle Ages. Uh, but uh, one can find irrational blames against Jews way before the turn of the first millennium, uh, for example, from the writings of church fathers. Uh, which also uh, comes down to the question of murdering Christ, as was mentioned, and, and these other Christian anti-Jewish blames, which had no base in, in reality. Uh, before the 20th century, uh, there were mainly uh, more like local type of blames uh, of uh, this anti uh, these Jewish conspiracies or anti-Semitic conspiracies. They were seldom presented in a global scale. And uh, they were quite specific, like in Finland, uh, during the civil rights struggle, Jews were told that they were exploiting the press of uh, the German press for their own benefit. Uh, they were blaming for being dishonest and dominant uh, when it comes to selling goods and handling money. Their morals were questions, and uh, there was a common understanding that Jews hated Christ and Christians and Christianity. And, and, and they were so specific that, for example, Finnish anti-Semitism, they could uh, give names to the newspapers in Germany, which were so-called Jewish newspapers that spread the uh, anti-Jewish propaganda. Uh, Protocols of Elders of Zion, that was mentioned uh, before, uh, it's, it's probably the most famous global uh, Jewish conspiracy, and it was published in, in, in Russia in the first years of the 20th century. Uh, but it started really to spread around well, uh, uh, after the First World War, and, uh, and Finland was uh, in a specific location because uh, the first translations of uh, Elders of Zion, Protocols of Elders of Zion, were made in Finland to other languages than Russia. Uh, coincident or not, it was the same time when also the myth of Judeo-Bolshevism started to spread around Europe. Uh, as historian Paul Hanebrink writes in his book Spectre Haunting Europe, uh, Judeo-Bolshevism refers to an idea according to which uh, Jews created and supported Bolshevism and are therefore responsible for its crimes. Uh, in other words, Jews were, being, uh, were behind revolution and they controlled and exploited post tsarist Russia. The myth of Judeo-Bolshevism rose from two different kinds of hatred, anti-communism and anti-Semitism, and these both were really important isms for many Christian anti-Semites especially. Uh, so the when the viewpoint uh, described by Hanebrink uh, there above uh, was developed and combined with the idea of Jewish world domination, then we are approaching the core of Judeo-Bolshevist conspiracy. So, uh, in my article, I found four different phases how this idea of international judeo bolshevik conspiracy developed. And uh, I presented them phases or stages or steps, you can, whatever you want to call them. Uh, it starts from the idea that most, in the newspapers, that the newspapers started to write that most important Bolsheviks are Jews. The, Jewish uh, the Bolshevik leaders are uh, of Jewish origin somehow. 
Uh, then it developed uh, to the second phase, where they said that the, the newspaper said that Jews controlled and exploited Bolshevist Russia. And then, uh, uh, thirdly, there came this sort of international uh, element to this idea that Jews led revolutions in, in Germany and in, in Hungary and, and tried, to, um, tried to spread Bolshevism all around the world. And there we can uh, come to the conclusion that there was some sort of international Judeo-Bolshevik conspiracy uh, and, and there were measures taken from Jews to uh, gain world domination. So these are the stages I will go through uh, next. So the first one, uh, that the most important Bolsheviks are Jews. Uh, the idea of a revolutionary Jew, it was established in the 19th century, and it was also known in Finland uh, before this. Uh, Jews had been blamed for, uh, for adopting revolutionary and anti-religious ideas, at least since the French Revolution. And uh, even before the Russian Revolution, rumors of a close relationship between Bolshevist movement and Jews spread around Russia. There were white nationalist army officers and officials of Kerensky regime uh, who began to distribute lists of revolutionary Jewish and otherwise foreign sounding names already in the summer of 1917, so before the revolution. And by 1918, uh, in Russia, these rumors had developed into a commonly accepted view that Jews were behind the Bolshevist revolution. And in many other countries, uh, there had been Jews who had been sort of uh, close to the leadership uh, of uh, certain countries. Jews had acted in history in different kinds of as different kinds of advisors or so on. But Russia does not have this kind of history, and the idea that Jews were being close to the leadership of Russia sounded most likely strange before the revolution. Uh, it didn't take long for this idea that leading Bolsheviks were uh, Jews to come to, to spread to Finland. Finland was still part of Russia in the end of November of 1917, when Hamina and Lehti, the newspaper in Hamina, which is a city, mid-sized city located in uh, southeastern Finland, near Russian border, they published two pictures, one of Lenin and one of uh, Lev Trotsky. And, and the, there was a text under the picture of Lenin that mail delivered from Russia. A picture of Lenin, leader of Russian Bolsheviks, and his appearance clearly shows his Jewish origin. And then there's a text under Trotsky's picture. Uh, first it tells about in, in, um, a meeting with English ambassador that went wrong. But then it says uh, Trotsky is of Jewish origin and he tries to cover it up with a Russian name he has taken. So Trotsky, whose name was originally Bronstein, uh, Finnish. Uh, this was like, this is really everyday anti-Semitism in Finland at that time. That Jews were, uh, they had some, some sort of uh, characteristics, appearances that you could recognize a Jew. That was one thing. And the other one here is that, that they try to hide it. Somehow they are, they are embarrassed that they are Jews, or they try to gain something from uh, making people believe that they are not Jews. And this is what this newspaper claims that Trotsky was doing, because he changed his name. To come back to this phase one, um, civil war of Finland broke out in January of 1918, so uh, about a month a month and a half, a couple of months after those pictures were published. And, and during that time, uh, the Finnish press did not write anything, practically anything about Jews. It was not an issue that there were other issues to cover at that time. But, uh, but in the summer of uh, 1918, Finnish press regarded uh, Bolshevism already as a Jewish idea. Uh, and, and it is probably safe to say that by the end of the year 1918, the idea that many of leading Bolsheviks were Jews, uh, and, and Jews were overrepresented in the Bolshevik administration, it had reached Finland and, and it was widely accepted. 
And also this, this question of Bolshevism being a Jewish idea, it sort of uh, goes back to the uh, 19th century when certain ideas uh, that had uh, public figures who were Jews represented certain ideas, then these ideas could have been called Jewish and, and, and the, the, these ideas were blamed to sort of uh, pursue Jewish goals. So uh, Bolshevism was one of these ideas in Finland after year 1918. Yes. Then we go to phase two. Um, Jews controlling and exploiting Bolshevist Russia. Um, so the fact uh, that Jews were overrepresented, or there were many Jews in the leadership of Bolshevism, it had consequences. Uh, an increasing number of eyewitness testimonies from post-revolutionary Russia started to prove that uh, when common Russians were struggling after the revolution, uh, there was shortage of food and, and uh, all the supplies. Bolshevik officials, who were according to testimonies almost consistently Jews, were benefiting from the situation. In other words, eyewitnesses said that Jews had it easy in Bolshevik Russia. Uh, first testimonies were published during the summer of 1918, and the number increased during the winter of 1918 and 1919. Uh, some of these stories were self-written, uh, some were interviews, some were even fictive. And, and presented, they were presented in a humorous manner. They were like jokes that in Russia, these and these things are happening, and, and then there is a Jew, and you can see that he is doing better. Uh, and that Jewish claims uh, were similar in, uh, in, in, in all these testimonies. Jews were blamed, for example, for cheating in businesses, in black market, and their administrative, in their administrative and governing duties, they were not honest, and they took bribes and evaded real work. And I have here one example of a text from a Norwegian newspaper, Tiden Steng, I found it about 10 years ago. Uh, I don't know, does, has anyone conducted any research in Norway after the First World War about Russian whites who have... Yeah. Right, yeah, you have, yeah. When was this? Okay. Yeah, okay, well, yeah. Because I was looking for that kind of research in 2016. Okay. <laughs> I didn't find it. Uh, but well, there, there, there's one example of, of uh, an article in Norwegian newspaper, which was, uh, I found this because of Finnish newspapers. Uh, this was quoted in many, many newspapers in Finland and especially because of the percentage there, 74% uh, of Bolsheviks are Jews. And, and uh, th this was um, uh, written by a Russian white colonel, Konstantin, I don't know how do you pronounce it, Greaves, Kreaves, and, and uh, he took part in the conversation about uh, Lemberi Bokrams uh, at that time in, in uh, December of 1918. And Finnish newspapers adopted this idea and many other eyewitness testimonies and, and, and they were certain that Jews controlled and exploited Russia and, and these numbers were accepted as facts that uh, Mr. Greavest there uh, presents. Then uh, states three or phase three uh, Jews led revolutions in Germany and Hungary. Uh, a step towards a global conspiracy was taken at the end of 1918, so about a year after the revolution. There was a Jäger recruiter and a national, nationalist activist who later became one of the most well-known Finnish fascists, Martti Pihkala. Uh, he called for all the Finnish-minded Finnish right-wing and agrarian parties, which is Finnish whites, uh, and he called them to take stand against Bolsheviks, 
those who are planning, planning a global Bolshevik state, an oligarchy, a dictatorship of brutals who call themselves poor and are, in most cases, Jews. This was published in November uh, of 1918 in Keski which is a fairly big city in the uh, in US, uh, uh, newspaper of fairly big city, Yuvaskula, in the uh, central Finland. And this is the earliest Finnish declaration that there might be interpreted, that might be interpreted in the way that there is a global Jewish conspiracy rising. Uh, Jews were connected to revolutions in Germany and Russia, uh, uh, Germany and Hungary in 1919, and, and that gave an explanation for events that seemed to make no sense, because the whole situation after the First World War was really hard to interpret. Uh, for people at that time, uh, uh, Tsar in Russia, uh, Tsar in Russia, also uh, Emperor in uh, Germany, in Austria, Hungary, everything, all these powers collapsed, and and there seemed to be no like proper explanation why this happened, and and for for a while even sort of rational people started to accept that maybe Jews have something to do with it. Uh, Finnish newspapers called also non-Jewish revolutionaries Jews, like Karl Liebknecht or uh, Lenin, for example. And, and uh, these events and key players remained as examples of Judeo-Bolshevik rule and revolutionary Jews in anti-Semitic te anti texts also in the future. And then we come down to the final stage, which was in the, in the uh, September of 1920. Uh, the first article in Finnish press presenting a full-scale Judeo-Bolshevik conspiracy was published in 27th of September 1920. Uh, it was a, a combination of current situation at that time with old anti-Semitic myths and stereotypes presented from the perspective of history of Jews. Article claimed that since the time when Jews were scattered across the world, uh, they have had hunger for gold, and they had perfected skills in gathering gold. And, and, and they wrote, and wherever even an ordinary, simple Jew settles, it doesn't take long before he has cleverly, cleverly placed Christians around him in debt to him. Uh, there are some similarities with the Protocols of Elders of Zion, for example, this uh, question of gold and uh, the connection between gold and Jews. Uh, but, uh, it, yeah, it is possible that the writer has read the protocols, but there were also other ideas which uh, refer to older anti-Semitism and Christian anti-Semitism. So I will conclude this with a couple of, couple of examples uh, from this text. It was a long text, and... Uh, to give an idea, what does it mean? Uh, what, what, what did that Judeo-Bolshevik conspiracy mean? He, and, and this means a Jew, he may be a monarchist today, supporter of a Republican, republic tomorrow, or a socialist or a communist, whatever seems to most ben to be beneficial to their own purposes. And where there is a where there is carrion, there they gather as ravens. Circumstances in Russia offer Trotsky, Zinoviev, Litvinov, Joffe, and numerous other Jews an excellent playground. They made their way to the leadership of revolutionary movements there and took them over so thoroughly that today Russia walks like a weak-willed animal on the leash of Jews. That was the first great attempt to make Jewish world domination real. Liberalism, socialism, communism, and anarchism are now all at the service of Jewish purposes. That is, the grimmest of the grim capitalism. So this part says that capitalism is behind it all. And, and uh, the one, of key, one, one key element in Judeo-Bolshevik uh, conspiracy is that there are these two powers. There is capitalism on the other side, and there is communism on the other side, and they both serve the same purpose. And capitalism controls money and, and, and finances, 
and, and communism controls masses, people, and their minds, gives the propaganda. And, and that is the uh, combination that is the, in the essence of Judeo-Bolshevik conspiracy. And then there is uh, also a part uh, where it's uh, referred to Finland, with us, in, uh, that is in Finland, as in many other countries, our eyes were blind to the truth that a Jew, no matter where he settles, remains a Jew with his own religion, his own national and universal traditions, which he pursues in silence, unnoticed, but decisively and unceasingly. The reins of world politics seem to be in their hands. So, there, uh, the writer says that Jews have already gained really strong power in world politics. And then that happened in three years, from the, less than three years, from the idea that first Bolsheviks were Jews, and that it ended up in three years to this. And uh, it even got forward, but that was not my uh, subject today. So, yeah. Thank you. Uh, I have conducted research on uh, on this uh, from from the similar time, and there are well, my dissertation thesis is uh, in Finnish, so that's probably unreachable to many. But uh, 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 I wrote an article uh, to this book on the right-hand side, Religion, Ethno-Nationalism and Antisemitism in the Era of Two World Wars. Uh, it's published by United States Holocaust Memorial Museum. Uh, and, uh, and there is an article of Finnish church and antisemitism in the, uh, after the First World War. So that's in English if uh, anyone is interested in reading. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Uh, we have five minutes for questions before we take coffee. If anyone wants to ask, yes. Uh, uh, <clears throat> thank you. Very, very interesting uh, lecture. Um, I think that the Jews were blamed for um, <sighs> financial uh, uh, problems because the one who started that you did not mention um, was Karl Marx, and Marx was Jewish. Uh, nevertheless, uh, I think that Marx's uh, ideology was uh, very didn't have contact with the normal people who were. Uh, that ideology would not fit uh, the man in the street. He was very, he, he, would, he would think that everybody is honest, everybody is perfect, and so on, while the man in the street, it's not like that. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, it's interesting contrasting this to what happened 20 years later, when Finland uh, fought the Soviets uh, with uh, the German forces, but the Finns did not want to give the Jews over to the Nazis. So evidently, the, there must have been a change of sentiment. Have you got any reflections on that? Uh, actually, yes. Uh, when it comes to anti-Semitism, there has been a common understanding uh, uh, for a long time in Finland. For, uh, there, are, there are several reasons for that that anti-Semitism was a product of Nazi Germany, and it rose uh, in the uh, 1930s, and it was uh, brought to Finland by these wannabe Nazis. And, and, uh, and, and there was no real background in anti-Semitism in Finland before that. And, and that has changed, uh, uh, research has, has proven in the last 20 or so years that uh, Actually, anti-Semitism was most strong in Finland in the 1880s, 1890s, and then in 1920s. And then in when 1930s, when uh, these extreme right movements started to spread in Finland, uh, they adopted anti-Semitism, and it sort of became more like a marginal phenomenon. 
But then again, we, when we talk about Christian anti-Semitism, that was present all the time. So uh, that's a, a bit, bit of a twofold question. Uh, but yeah, and, and all can of, of course reply more on, on the uh, uh, the uh, deportations of Jews during the Second World War. His expertise in that. Thank you very much. Uh, I wanted to ask you, you were referring to the Finnish press in 1918, which is, of course, you, with which you mean the, the white press. In your survey of the press, uh, which you, you use as the basis of, of this paper, did you take a look into the pre-Civil War uh, socialist labor movement press and, and their representations of, of anti-Semitism? Uh. Well, I, I didn't go that far in, in 1917 because I started from the October Revolution mainly. I, I looked briefly before that. But um, I, I know that after that, for example, uh, Tuomies uh, newspaper, which is a Christian labor, like left-wing Christian magazine uh, newspaper, uh, they adopted certain anti-Semitic ideas in the beginning of 1930s that were straight from the Lapua movement and, and the right-wing activists. So uh, it was not a sort of... Um, e even though it was social democrats and the left-wing parties that uh, were pro-Jews in, in this... Uh, um, when, when Jews were trying to uh, gain emancipation in Finland, uh, there, there were certain left-wing... Uh, actors that also had anti-Semitic views. Yeah. Last comment, just, or uh, more than question, but I think uh, what you show is a very interesting uh, kind of expansion of the conspiracist uh, interpretation mm -hmm. from, uh, from a more um, coded associations and, and so on to the full-blown worldview. Mm. Uh, and I, th I think you can find uh, mainly the same development, or development also in Norway, uh, where it starts with uh, short hand descriptions like Bronstein Trotsky. Mm. Uh, they, they put his name in... Uh, in uh, they add the Bronstein to the name Trotsky, for example. Then in 1920, especially, you find a full-blown version that you describe in the phase four, in a way also. Yeah, there were many people who really believed it for a while. Then it sort of swifted away in the mid-1920s. And, and, and that, that was really interesting because it, when, when you uh, conduct research on anti-Semitism, there are always these extreme anti-Semites. But I think the most imp interesting ones are the sort of half intelligent people who sort of uh, fall into the trap in, in, in certain uh, situations in history. Yeah. Thank you very much. Then, uh, <laughs> then we have a short coffee break. There are some biscuits, uh, also some, uh, how shall I translate it, twist. <laughs> And tomorrow there's actually also free lunch, and there are such thing as a free lunch if you come tomorrow. <laughs> yes. Okay, then we start again. Uh, our next speaker has been uh, presented already, I think. Nicola is editor of the special issue that we launched today, and she's also an associate professor in social science at Østfold University College. She even uh, is a co-head of the steering committee of NORFAS, the NORFAS network, Nordic mm -hmm. Fascism, studies of Nor Nordic Fascism. And she has been a part of the research project Democratic Institutions Facing Nazi Occupation, Norway in a Comparative Perspective at the Holocaust Center between 2013 and 2017, where she actually had the pleasure to share office with me for three years. It was a quite a pleasure, really. <laughs> no, I mean it. Nicola has published several books and articles on Norwegian and 
German and English history on topics such as fascism, anti-Semitism, and occupation history, particularly with respect to the Nordic countries. And she are going to she is going to talk about anti-Semitism in the Norwegian context with uh, with focus on the uh, on 1940 to 1945 the German occupation. Thank you. I had a bit too little microphone in the beginning. So I hope I have enough microphone now. That's yours. Yeah, uh, we heard that already. Um, thank you, Shete. Um As you probably realized, I'm presenting this on behalf of the two of us. So it could be equally being Shete standing here and talk to you. So we just split roles. And I will be you and you will be me. Um, I will talk about the apocalyptic battle, or what was considered as the apocalyptic battle, uh, during the Norwegian occupation in conspiracist anti-Semitism. And that is also the title of our um, paper in this special issue. And I think I would like to start with an anecdote, just to give you an expression, impression about what research also means. Because as I said earlier today, we had slightly started working on Weltdienst, the Norwegian translation is Verdenstjernesten, and, and it was rather easy to access. There's in Norway, you would find the journal as the National Library, and then we contacted the German National Library, where you would find the German editions, and asked them for getting digitalized version, and they just turned it down, and said we couldn't have it because we had to ask the, um, the editor or those who have the copyright for permission. And then I said, well, the problem is, as you know, the um, copyright goes with Alfred Rosenberg, and he was executed in Nuremberg in 1946. Um, and even if he wouldn't been executed, he would probably be dead by now. And certainly, I don't think we researchers just ask prominent national socialists for permission. And I said, yeah, well, let's see, we send this to the law department. And um, to our surprise, the law department turned our request down. We back then thought it was quite logical that we had good reason to ask, but I don't know if you know the anecdote, I have to just tell it again. Um, we got access in the end and we found some other solutions, but it was a bit, well, Messy. surprising to say the least that they didn't find our argumentation as coherent as we did. Uh, anyway, um, I have a structure of the presentation in uh, three main parts. I will briefly talk about anti-Semitism in Norway in, in the period we've been investigating, and then I will dive into these three journals we've been analyzing in our paper. As I said, one of them is Weltdienst, or uh, rather the Norwegian edition Verdenstjernist, and then we have two other Norwegian journals, Hirtmann and National Tidskrift. I'm sure several of you have heard of them before. And uh, when we decided to analyze um, these journals, we also uh, we're wondering how to approach this, and then um, landed on having three main topics we would like to look into, which we call ideological patterns, exchanges of topics, and transfer to local realities. And then I just will give you a brief sum up in the end to not run out of time. So you have to tell me in case I do so. Um, as I guess most of you are aware of, um, anti-Semitism in Norway was um, existing, but not in a violent form, at least until 1940. So you would find anti-Semitism in a more cultural production or in political debates, like these cartoons from the 1910s and 1920s. And um, you would also have these classical conspiracy themes in, in the conservative press. So all in all, the Jew served as an elastic symbol for all negative aspects of new modernity, as also Kapawa partly was mentioning the ideas that there were the Jews who stand behind Bolshevism, capitalism, and I mean, you name it, all the usual uh, prejudices again, uh, um, behind feminism. Um, but um, it still, as I just said, never became violent, but remained in this form of more cultural production. Um, you also had partly um, racist ideas about the Jews, uh, even more when they became prominent in Nazi Germany, and also through um, race research and the transfer of race research between also Germany and Norway in particular. But uh, it wasn't dominating anti-Semitism before Nazi occupation. 
Um, and then in 1940, and I'm sure you know that too, um, Norway still was one of the smallest Jewish communities in Europe, even so there had been a larger group of Jewish immigrants coming from continental Europe due to, to the politics of Nazi Germany. But in um, 1940, we still talk about 2,100 individuals, which is about the same number as we had Jews in Finland. I think it was 1,800. So both Norway and, and, and Finland were those countries with the smallest numbers in Western Europe. And in Norway, 40% of them were murdered in the Holocaust. And the only number in, uh, in Western Europe, which is larger, the Netherlands, was 75%. Um, I'm not going too much into the occupation regime, as you know. Um, in 1940, uh, autumn 1940, a collaboration system was established with national summing and with increasing, which you sorry, can see on this legendary. How is this working, actually? There was this nice pointer, which I don't find now. No. <laughs> okay. I, uh, any, I think you recognize Quisling on these pictures without a pointer. Um, but um, the idea of establishing a, a Volksgemeinschaft or a people's community in Norway was a project very much of national assembling, uh, which made this um, its major, um, major goal, also to impress uh, the German occupiers, and, uh, and in, in the uh, near future also become an equal part of the Greater Germanic Reich. And in this Greater Germanic Reich, or in the Nordic read Germanic read um, Aryan Volksgemeinschaft was uh, no place for a, a Jewish uh, community or Jews in general. And uh, in light of this, it's also no wonder that um, National Assembly was not even supporting uh, Nazi politics, but also asking for more radical measures. So also um, the anti-Jewish measures you would find in Norway are not only an exclusively a German project, but also equally a project of, of uh, Norwegian National Socialists. Um, at the same time, Norway was flourished by uh, a lot of anti-Semitic conspiracies journals or uh, conspiracies anti-Semitic journals. Um, we've been looking into three of these, but there are, of course, uh, others like Fritz Volk, the party newspaper of, of National Assembly. But we were particularly interested in, in these three journals we decided for because they all were conspiracists all the way. And, and we were particularly interested in, in looking into their argumentation, their style, how would they promote their, their project. And at the same time, this was all the chance we got through this special issue to link it to the other Nordic countries, to compare it with the other Nordic countries, and also look into what kind of ideological transfer was taking place between them. Weltdienst, um, well, I mentioned at the beginning, uh, was originally a German journal founded in 1933 by Ulrich Fleischhauer, who was by that time already a prominent member of the so-called Völkisch Movement. I don't know if you heard of it which was a radical, anti-Semitic, ultra-national, ultra-racist, basically all negative ultras you can find movement. And, and Fleischhauer had this idea um, as a proponent of this movement to, to find a journal which would um, not only promote these ideas of the Turkish movement in regard of anti-Semitism, but also in general function as a tool of a worldwide struggle against Jewry. So it was both meant as a journal and as a tool, and also at the same time uh, meant to be an international secret network. So his approach itself was uh, conspiracist too, which is also why you would find it in so many languages. So he started already in 1933 with three languages, and then in, in the end of the uh, Second World, we would find uh, the journal in 21 languages. Surprisingly, not in Finnish, which I think you're going to say a bit about, maybe. Um, he would also, and that's all, it's also interesting that you see the, how equally they work, or how uh, similarized the, uh, simple the ideas are. Uh, you have this um, lexicon or encyclopedia about the Jews, where he would uh, name Jews or map people he considered to be Jewish, which is also not a new idea. That's something he picked from the Turkish movement. And most is interesting about his journal, in fact, is how long he could promote it as a one-man business or, let's say, an in, uh, independent business, even in the Third Reich. So as you can see, when it was 
finally incorporated in this Institute for Research on the Jewish Question, which also is recognized in Norwegian research because Quisling was one of the main speakers when it opened in Frankfurt. And this is from the opening where you also can find Alfred Rosenberg on the left-hand side. Uh, that is quite late, 1939, so that you would have a journal and even a network which could work such long in the Third Reich without being so-called gleichgeschaltet. Um, and even before that, it was quite influential that this uh, quote shows from, from uh, Chief Rabbi Markus Ehrenreich in Germany in 1935 saying the center of anti-Jewish propaganda is Erfurt, where the journal was based. Unfortunately, Erfurt is also the center of the far right today in Germany, as you maybe know, uh, with Thuringia being the, the federal state with the highest number of AfD voters and also being the federal state where uh, Björn Höcke, um, also partly in on left, is called Bernd Höcke, uh, trying to, to get um, a position as so-called minister president. So the election takes, it's just around the corner. So you could say all brown roads in a way led, uh, lead to, to Erfurt and to Rungia, unfortunately. It's almost a running gag if it wouldn't be not that, not funny. Um, I don't know how many of you read German, and now it would be nice if this pointer would work. I don't even have it anymore. Here it is. Um, but this is what you have as a sort of ingress in each number or each edition of the journal about its uh, major goals, saying um, it has to uh, enlighten, and that is something Lars is also going to talk about tomorrow, these ideas of enlightenment. It has to enlighten the badly informed non-Jews about the information um, and, and give information about the activities of the Jewish underworld. And in the end, it, of course, would also ask for money. The first sentence is that they don't ask for money, and the last sentence is that they have to, nevertheless. Um, the Norwegian editions, along with the Danish and Swedish edition, uh, came from 1940, the year of the occupation. And they all lasted until 1944, with the exception of Denmark, which continued until 1945. And what Chetil and I saw in the beginning when we worked on that is that you would see that this, these editions do or adapt to, to the particular Norwegian, read Swedish, read uh, Danish situation. And, and it was both surprising and a bit disappointing that it doesn't. So when you look into the journal, you very quickly find out that it's all translations of overarching conspiracies, anti-Semitic ideas, uh, which do not refer to particular um, local contacts, not even those which were considered as a success, for example, the deportations of the Jews from, from Norway. And that is one of the main differences to a journal like Hürtmann, for example, which was uh, a pure uh, Norwegian um, activity started in 1940, firstly as the Journal of Hürden, which was a paramilitary unit of Fritz Fulk, which itself considered as a party card reorganization, and, and Hürden was also actively taking part in anti-Jewish measures, um, also, for example, in the arrestations of Jews before had the deportation, and then in a short period also served as a mouthpiece for the Norwegian SS. And what is the difference to, to Bernd Stjernesen is that here it would ask for concrete radical anti-Jewish measures uh, in Norway, and it would also defend the deportation of the Norwegian Jews after 1942. And the same you can say about National Tidskrift, which is the oldest of the three journals, established already in 1916. In regard of content and style, it's very much closer to Werdenstjernisten. Uh, it's also very much inspired by the Folkish movement and by German anti-Semitism. And also here, conspiracism is crucial for both content and style. And Zülten, who basically run this journal as a sort of one-man business, um, was also one of the early promoters of the Elders of Sign, which uh, Shiti already talked a bit about, and, uh, and Pao as well. And he was also publishing, and as I said, it's the same idea as you would find in Werdenstein, in this who's who in the Jewish world, giving information about Jews or people who were supposed to be Jews, or he considered to be Jewish. And um, based on this information he was collecting over the years, he was also assisting the German security police in, in getting an overview of Jews in Norway, uh, which they then could use before I had the deportation. So by doing this, he was actively participating in the Holocaust, which took place in Norway, 
even so he was not involved in party politics. Um, as I said, we were in particular looking into three, um, three approaches, ideological patterns, exchange of topics, and transfer to local realities. And, and as you probably already understood by listening to me, um, none of these genres had an original or innovative approach. You could also say they're rather boring, if you're familiar with the, with the topic, because it's over and over a very monological, anti-Jewish, uh, conspiracist worldview, uh, reproducing ideas which already had been existing for a while. And, um, and in short, if you would sum up which are the main ideas, that is, is firstly the idea of a Jewish world conspiracy, and secondly the idea of a racial de degeneration which would take place due to, to Jewish activities. And uh, talking about the apocalyptic battle, because that becomes uh, important in particular during the wars that uh, all these genres considered uh, um, a sort of end game uh, being taking place in the form of the Second World War between Jews and, and Germanic people. And within this end game or apocalyptic battle, uh, national social German was considered as the major force, the major tool or defender of, of the Germanic people. And uh, she had already explained the term redemptive anti-Semitism, but this sort of redemption only could be reached when Germany and the other Germanic nations had won this war. Um, there was also uh, this idea, which you would find in all these three journals, that uh, the major two of the Jews on their sides were young, whether democratic nations. So why Germany was fighting this war as a sort of self-defense, and where the democratic nations, which didn't understand that they were surfing a, a Jewish cause, as this quote says, year after year, day in, day out, Judaism has incited the democratically governed nations to war against anti-Jewish National Socialist Germany. No means was too simple for the Jews to achieve the goal they had set themselves, namely to bring about the war against Germany, which says it's Jews who started the war, not Germany. World Jewry has reached its goal. The nations and their governments, which for a number of years have been incited by Jewry, have allowed themselves to take up arms against Germany in favor of, of Jewry. And this is the Norwegian edition from 1942. Uh, hand in hand with the idea was also that um, the Jews were planning to extinguish uh, Germans. And then they would use examples like this book, Germany Must Perish. I don't know if you've heard of it from written by the uh, Jewish-American journalist Theodor Kaufmann, where he was arguing that, um, that Germany also could survive, no, excuse me, that the Jews only could survive by sterilizing all Germans. And this was a use, uh, book that they would use in these journals to prove that, as sort of this finally tells us, it's, it's Germany who's only defending a war of, of self-defense, or fighting a war of self-defense. Um, when we looked into the exchange of topics, it turned out to be rather difficult because since at least Weltdienst and also National Tietzschrift had this idea of being conspiracist, they would avoid to mention their sources. So you have a lot of articles and so-called proofs and information from all over the world where they wouldn't say where the information steams from or who is the writer or subscriber. Um, so we used uh, quite some time to try to map this. And it turned out that a lot of leads, again, go back to Nazi Germany and journals of the Folkish movement like Hammer, where we also have a Swedish edition we're going to hear about tomorrow, or Rasse, which was a, a journal of the Folkish Nordic movement. And then you would also have this transfer of ideology between these three journals and other Scandinavian publications, as, for example, Hammer and the Swedish edition of or Kamteiner a journal of, of the um, Swedish National Socialists, which we're also going to hear about, about tomorrow. Um, when we talk about transfer to Norwegian local realities, and I already said that Verdenstjernesten um, was not commenting on the particular Norwegian situation, uh, the other two journals uh, considered themselves very much as told holders of a specific Norwegian anti-Semitism. Even so, it was basically copy and paste from other places in the world. 
And they had these very concrete suggestions for anti-Jewish measures in occupied Norway, how they were supposed to look like, and they were also defending and praising the deportations of the Norwegian Jews in 1942. But since we are talking about redemptive anti-Semitism, which means the Germanic people are not safe before all Jews in the world are extinguished, um, their argumentation didn't end with the deportation of the Norwegian Jews, but they would also continue their struggle against the so-called Jewish spirit um, after 1942, and you would even find at least in National Tietzschrift examples of early Holocaust denial in 1944. And as this quote says here, it goes without saying that the Jewish question soon will be solved within this country, as we often have suggested, the Jews who are not Europeans will hopefully soon be a phenomenon of the past in Europe uh, in October 1940, though this is already two years before the deportation actually took place. So in sum, um, all the three journals uh, were promoting a conspiracist anti-Semitism which doesn't even need the existence of Jews, so you could basically use it everywhere based on the idea that redemption has to take place um, through their final extinguishing then the idea that history and politics in general and completely are an apocalyptic battle between forces of light, which obviously are, in, are the Germanic, again, Nordic, Aryan people, and, 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 and darkness, uh, who they consider to be the Jews. And uh, this model of interpretation was important also to explain Germany's warfare, Germany's warfare in particular in the East, uh, and in Eastern Europe, um, and it was also to explain their leaders that basically every development in the world was orchestrated, or let's say every development which is negative for the Germanic people is um, orchestrated by, by a Jewish conspiracy. Um, and as I just said, um, this wouldn't stop with the extermination of the Norwegian Jews, because this is only, a, in their eyes, a minor part of, of the overarching redemption process, which is why they, after 1942, would continue uh, with an anti-Semitism without Jews. Yeah, I think I stop here. Thank you for your attention. <laughs> yeah. So we have some time for questions, and if you keep it short, more people will also have their questions answered. So. You wrote that with me, but yeah. No. You have no question. Yeah, I would be rather astonished. <laughs> Did I forget anything? Just uh, thinking about uh, the. Um, yes, I, I, I've co written the article, so. <laughs> but uh, the. the word anti-Semitism without Jews and uh, the related term Jewish spirit. Mm. What is interesting here also, in addition to what you said, is that they use the word Jewish spirit uh, as a kind of term related to what they call the infection of non-Jews with Jewish ideas. Mm. So after the Norwegian Jews were deported, they say that although the physical threat of the Jews are, uh, are gone, Jewish ideas still uh, exist in Norwegian society, in a sense. Uh, and uh, th that was, for example, the ex explanation for the uh, Norwegian resistance against uh, mm. uh, national socialism and uh, the new ordering of, of Norway. Mm. So that's an important component also of this mm. anti-Semitism without Jews. Uh, uh, which is uh, a bit self-promotion, as you can see, we also have written an <laughs> article about. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Nicola, for this excellent presentation. Uh, I'm a bit curious about this sentence, um, early Holocaust denial, 1944. Mm. Mm. Can you say a little bit more about this? What kind of Holocaust denial, how was it phrased, and why yeah. already in 1944? If you have found already, I something. can start because I know you know more about it. But I can start since I'm standing here. No, um, in National Tidskrift you would find these articles where they refer to 
um, deportations um, or um, the Holocaust which are taking place on the continent. So it's not um, about the, the Norwegian Jews in there and, and what happened to them, but about uh, what happened to, to European Jews. And then they would um, describe this as something which is made up and, and uh, a story, a false story to produce pity with the Jews. Um, and that is something which we already have from 1940. I mean, all the journals disappeared in 1945. So obviously they wouldn't continue with that after the war. But this was at a time where it wasn't, uh, where the Holocaust in Norway wasn't promoted as such. And, um, and where, um, I, I'm not sure, I don't think other Norwegian journals, I mean, we didn't look into all of them, obviously, where we're talking about the Holocaust is taking place, but it's a lie. So this distinguishment as such, to mention it, but then to say um, that uh, but it's not existing, that was rather new as far as at least I understood it. This was before, I think, the article is about, actually, about the deportation of the uh, Hungarian, Jews, yeah. Jews in Hungary, oh. which are, uh, they describe it as a uh, cry of self-pity and blah, 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 and uh, claim that... Uh, that uh, um, it was not that bad that they said, basically. <laughs> It's just a comment to that. There is an ongoing research project in Sweden about this kind of early Holocaust denial, and, and uh, it's a study of Natunel Tidskrift and the Dags Post, and which were the two uh, main mouthpieces of Sveriges Nationella Forbund, uh, the Swedish National Association. Uh, and there it's quite obvious that Holocaust denial follows logically from a certain number of positions taken from 1938 and onwards. So when uh, news about the ongoing genocide uh, starts appearing, uh, it becomes quite logical for those people to just deny it, because they've got the, uh, the uh, they've accepted the idea of, of the World War II as a race war between the Germans and the rest, and, and especially between the Germans and the Jews. They've accepted that well, everything bad said about Germany that's lies, and so on and so forth, and, and they have this kind of conspiracist understanding of the world. And that means when they're faced with these kind of allegations, they say, no, no, this has not happened. This is part of the conspiracy. This is part of the Jews presenting themselves as victims, and so on and so forth. And that starts already in 1943, and it's Stefan Bruchfeldt who is soon defending his thesis on this. Jeg vil tilbake til den jødiske spiriten. Eh, motstanden, motstandsfolket, jeg kan skjønne at de satte på det, men altså, kirken reiste seg jo mot dette. Det var jo ikke mange naziprester i, i Norge, og sammen med lærerne, så det var jo mange. Og så er det noe helt annet. Jeg hørte på en israeli for ikke så lenge siden, og han hevdet at en polsk forfatter, 88 år gammel, husket fra krigen, og han hadde sagt, det er verre nå, for på 30-tallet og 40-tallet var det ingen som ropte død over jødene i våre gater. At det var mer skjult. Jeg vet ikke om dere kjenner noe til hvordan det var på 30-tallet på det. Det er jo litt sånn sammensatt spørsmål, for, for å være ærlig. Altså det er, hvis jeg forstår det riktig, er om du spør hvor mye man ser en sånn åpen gate antisemitisme, på, ja, men i hvilken grad man så det på 30- eller 40-tallet, det er jo det ene spørsmålet, men det andre er jo egentlig heller hvordan for eksempel sivil motstand stilte seg til, til forfølgelsen. Hvordan fikk de på Kina kunne komme til den jødiske ånd, må de bekjempe? Ja, men altså, nå har jo jeg jobbet faktisk en del med sivil motstand og lærer nå, og det som jeg syntes var jo litt påfallende, uten at jeg har forsket så mye mer på det, er jo at lærerne talte jo ikke jødene sak på noen som helst tidspunkt offisielt eh, i, i sine organer. Altså skjønt at disse organer er uansett ikke offisielt, men de er forbudt, men seg imellom, og når de framet sånn å si hele eh, holdningskampen, så var det jo en 
en holdningskamp som fant sted på vegne av skoleelevene som ikke skulle nazifiseres, som fant sted på vegne av lærerne selv, som ikke skulle tvinges inn i en nazistisk organisasjon. Og denne kampen som da kulminerte våren 42, den tok jo ikke opp forhold for jødene i Norge. Det var jo ikke et tema som dukket opp i noen av disse parolene. Du ser jo at det er enkelte lærer som uttaler seg om jødeforfølgelse i Tyskland på 30-tallet, men ikke på 40-tallet, så kunne man jo innvende, ok, deportasjon eller arrestasjon våren 1942 har jo ikke funnet sted enda, og når de fant sted, så var jo lærerne egentlig i sluttsfasen av denne kampen om skolen. Altså de var jo nettopp blitt løslatt fra kyrkene, så de var kommet tilbake til hjemmebyene sine, så det var veldig fortolket som en kjempesuksess mot NS-regimet, men samtidig deportasjonen av jødene fant jo sted nesten parallelt. Så det burde man jo egentlig forske mer på. Er det fordi lærerne rett og slett var opptatt med sin egen sak, eller fordi de var under enormt press selv med å opprettholde denne holdningskampen? Eller er det rett og slett også fordi jødisk liv var så lite present i skolen, at det rett og slett ikke var noe som de... Altså, de snakket jo om den nazifisering de selv opplevde, men de snakket jo ikke om den forfølgelsen av jødene, eller den segregeringen i form av at man trar inn deres radioapparater, i form av at man arrestere enkelte jøder og så videre. Det blir jo ikke nevnt. Så denne holdningskampen er jo veldig en sånn, synes i hvert fall jeg, rettet mot å forsvare seg selv og sine verdier, men uten at man tar opp det jødiske spørsmålet, rett og slett. Når det gjelder sånn åpen antisemitisme på gatene på 40-tallet, så var dette jo utgangspunktet ikke ønsket av tyskerne eller okkupasjonsmakten heller. Altså man ville jo unngå at det rettes... Dette er faktisk noen andre som kan bedre enn meg. Men man ville jo unngå at man retter oppmerksomheten mot jødene. Altså når for eksempel Hurden gikk jo ut og malte hakekors på jødiske butikker, så var dette jo noe som regimet absolutt fravett seg, som de jo ikke skulle ha. Også for å unngå reaksjoner. Dere må jo gjerne karrigere meg her. Så sånn sett kan du si, ok, sånn åpen antisemitisme var ikke ønsket, i hvilken krav den var synlig, er jo et annet spørsmål. Vil du stere? I didn't want to answer that at the moment, but just a bit more about the phrase or the term Jewish spirit. This was first and foremost an pseudo-explanation model for used to to, uh, to explain why National Socialism didn't gain uh, momentum in Norway in that sense. Why didn't the population uh, um, support National Socialism? Uh, the National Socialists saw themselves as members of a chosen elite that have, uh, had revealed uh, the true meaning of history and politics and everything like that. It was a totalitarian ideology. And why the question they had to ask themselves was why do not people support ideas that we know are right in a sense it's because there is a powerful conspiracy represented by among other things jewish ideas that have infected the norwegian people including the church for example they called, uh, for example, the, the claim that Norwegian Christianity, for example, were infected by Jewish ideas. Mm. That's, a, that's an important aspect here. Mm. If I may, we have to remember that National Samling was a fringe political party until 1940, mm. the 9th of April. And they didn't gain any power whatsoever. So that I think that... Uh, what we have seen um, from the comic, uh, from, the, from the books, etc., that there are some anti-Semitism in the crime uh, literature and uh, uh, other sort of fringe literature, but there was uh, no openly open uh, anti-Semitism as, 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 as we have, for example, seen today. It doesn't have the same mm. magnitude. Yeah, and as I also said, it was never violent before before the occupation. Uh, I wonder, because we kind of now have moved over to concluding remarks. Uh, are there any questions, overarching questions, to also the others who presented today or comments? 
um, tomorrow. Um, and we hope to see you all again tomorrow. We will start a bit earlier. Uh, no, I have to <laughs> go all the way back. Um, this is tomorrow. Yeah. Um, yeah. We start at 11 o'clock. As you see, we have about half an hour to warm up. Um, and then we have first another presentation by Ola from Finland. And then we have a presentation about Sweden with Lars. And as you can see, the third presentation will take part on Zoom. Because Sophia, unfortunately, couldn't come. And we will um, have a last presentation with uh, Graham from 2 o'clock. And as I also said earlier, don't forget the, the guided tour. And we have coffee break tomorrow. And we have... Oh, sorry. sorry no and sorry. a free lunch. And a free lunch. Yeah, we have a free lunch. So if you're not interested in the topic, at least we can offer free lunch. <laughs> okay. Uh, I think we conclude for today. If you don't want to add anything, I... Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you for coming.